Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of BMSC Live. We're here aboard the Alta in Imperial Eagle Channel off the west coast of Vancouver Island. We are halfway between the territories of two new channel First Nations. On this side, we have Huayat Territory. That's the direction where Bamfield is. And in the opposite direction, we have Tashat Territory in the Broken Group Islands of what is now called the Broken Group Islands. My name is Kelly and I'm an educator at the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center or BMSC for short. We are a not-for-profit registered Canadian charity and a shared campus of five different universities, which are the University of Alberta, University of Calgary, Simon Fraser University, the University of Victoria, and the University of British Columbia. For almost 50 years, we've been bringing researchers who come from all over the world to study here in Barclay Sound. They collect their data in this kind of environment. We also offer four credit university courses, as well as field trips for students, for school groups. So that's a lot of fun stuff going on at the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center. Much of our educational programming is funded through an organization called NSERC Promo Science. So without the support of NSERC, we wouldn't be able to provide shows like this for you here today. So thank you very much to NSERC Promo Science. Now, I have several crew members that are helping me out here today, and I want to introduce them to you. Some of them are new faces that you haven't seen before on one of our episodes of BMSC Live. So let's take a moment to get to know the other people on board here. Let's start with right behind the camera there that's bringing you this show. That's Luke. You may have um, met Luke in some of the other Alta episodes. He was also videographer in those shows, and he's going to be working the camera for you here today. And then off to the side here, we have Stacy. You also met Stacy in some of the previous shows. So she's helping to run the boat and the gear and keeping us safe out here on the water. And then one more person on board our deck here today. This is one of our new faces. This is Captain Dave. He is working the gear at the back of the vessel right now and bringing us our dredge today. More about that in just a moment. But welcome, Dave, to our show. All right, back on land, we also have Phil, who's managing the technology side of things, and you've met Phil in previous shows. Normally, this would be the part of the show where we go to Phil and he shows you a Google map of where we are, but we actually have another team member to introduce to you today, and that is Dr. Marjorie Wanham, who is a faculty member at Quest University. And Marjorie is also a prof at Bamfield Marine Sciences Center, where she teaches the Marine Invertebrate Zoology course for uh, summer university students. So Mara has been coming out to Bamfield for many years and teaching students about invertebrates. And we thought that we would invite her along today to help out because we needed a little bit of extra guidance in um, explaining some of the invertebrates that we're about to find because it turns out we have some weird creatures that we'll be showing you today so thank you very much to mar for joining us on our show excellent all right so um let's go back to phil for a moment and he can give us a, a little tour of the area where we're located here on the Alta, where Mar is located, and everything else. Take it away, Phil. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so just to give you an idea of where things are located in the world, where Banfield is, where the dredge is happening. So here we have our Earth, the image and scroll down into Vancouver Island on the west side of Vancouver, of Canada right here, as we zoom in slowly. So you'll see that. Uh, so as mentioned, Mar is visiting us virtually from Squamish. Squamish is up here on the coast. And Banfield is over here on the west side of Vancouver Island. Here we have Barkley Sound. And the Banfield is here. And Banfield Marine Science Center is right on the edge right here. Um, let me show you where the main building is. If you've been here, you're quite familiar with the area. The Rick Center, the main building, the Whale Lab. And our dredge is happening from the other side of the Deer Group Islands. So our crew are located right around here amongst the Deer Group, right past the Deer Group Islands. All right, back to you, Kelly. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, this is our furthest field trip yet for one of these 
live shows. So it's really fun to get out to a new location. And we have a fun show planned for you here today. We are doing a mud dredge. And maybe you've seen some of the other episodes where we used the Alta to do a different kind of dredge. Today, we're exploring a whole new habitat. And it's um, much deeper water. And we'll be finding some of the animals that come up from the very muddy bottom of our ocean here. They're about 80 meters underwater below me right now. And I can see Captain Dave at the back of the boat. He's just pulling up the, the dredge from the bottom. So let's watch how this is done. And so we have Stacy controlling the winch that is hooked onto the dredge basket. And this dredge, you may remember from the other Alta shows, we had a much smaller dredge, but this one is a little bit larger and it looks very full. Oh, this is really exciting. Can you guys see what's falling out from underneath? That dredge basket is full of mud. And I cannot wait to dig inside and see what is hiding in this mud. Oh, we are going to make a mess today, everybody. <laughs> that looks fantastic. Yes, thank you, Mar, for um, joining us here today. Um, this is a real treat to be. Uh, <laughs> this mud is looking nice and slimy. Mm, great, kind it's of a obscuring... treat for me. <laughs> Sorry. It's a treat for me, too, to be here. Mm. Oh, look at all that. It's going to be so good. Yeah, so Mar has been teaching classes in Banfield for many years, and she often gets to do this activity with her students, but this is the second best way to do a mud dredge so that everybody gets to be involved. And we're pretty excited to be bringing this here to you today. Can you see how much mud is coming out of that net? It's filling our sorting table here. It looks pretty wild too. It doesn't seem like there could possibly be any animals living in this mud. It's just a big slimy pile of brown muck. But it doesn't look I very bet, appetizing. No way, not at all. But I think we'll we'll try and look around inside this mud and see if we can find some things living inside of it. Just gonna wait until Dave and Stacy finish putting away the dredge basket. And then once it's safe for us to get into that sorting table, we'll start digging around. Oh. Kelly, can you yeah. tell us, I, I wish I were there in person. I love my dredges. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're smelling or feeling or hearing as all of this is happening? Mm -hmm. Well, so far, all I'm hearing is the sound of the hydraulic winch um, being put back into place now that it's finished working with the dredge. But now I can get in a little bit closer and we can actually start having a look at this mud. And first off, I got to tell you about the smell. It's, it's very unique. Um, the smell of this mud, oh, well, it's like mud, but it's stinkier than normal mud. It's kind of like sulfury. It's kind of like sour or rotten. Um, it, it doesn't smell very good. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm right in it. I, there's no going back now. So let's get, uh, let's have a good look at some of the creatures that we may be able to find if we start digging through this mud. And look, we've already found our first creature. I feel like a kid in a sandbox. There is so much fun stuff going on in here. Okay, this is an animal. Well, what does it feel funny. like, Kelly? It looks like, a, <laughs> it looks like a, I don't even know what it looks like. It looks like a blob. Yeah, it does look like a blob because it's covered in mud. Do any of our viewers want to guess what this may be? Hmm. And I should remind our viewers, actually, if you tuned in last week, you may have remembered we we gave away a toque to a, a viewer who participated by either asking or answering a question. And we're going to do the same thing this week. So if you would like to participate in our show, you can use the comment function or the chat function and let us know what you think this animal i know it just looks like a blob of mud but there is some there's some bristles poking out right here on the side and maybe you can start typing in some answers and while you do that i'm going to start rinsing this animal off 
Kelly, is it is it soft and squishy or is it hard? Is it, it heavy? Is, is it light? It's more hard than squishy, so it's not squishy. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it appears to be covered in bristles that they're not sharp, but they feel almost like a toothbrush. Like you could just brush your teeth with this animal. It's a toothbrush um, animal. We have a we have one guess from a uh, from one of our audience members. Somebody guessing it is a sea urchin. Well, that, you know that sounds correct. It does. It's a special kind of sea urchin. Does anybody have any further ideas about what special kind of sea urchin? Well, we have um, on over on YouTube Olivia Walker saying that it is an urchin as well. Another guess there. Great job, you guys. This urchin, do you notice how it has almost like a little indent on one end oh. and it's kind of rounded? I would say it almost looks heart shaped. Imagine that. <laughs> Kelly, how else does it look different from a from a typical urchin that you might find on our on a rocky shore? Well, I want to just rinse it off a little bit more for you here, because one of the things that I'm struggling with with this urchin is I can't find where its mouth is. Where would you look for the mouth on a regular urchin? It would be right in the center. Normally, right in the middle of the urchin, you would have the mouth, but there's no mouth there. Hmm. And what about on the top? Would you what would you normally find on the top? They would just be covered in really big spines. Um, and there is usually the anus somewhere on the top of the urchin, usually right in the center. And this one, because it lives in the mud and it burrows in one direction and it, it creates itself a mud burrow underground, this symmetrical animal has migrated its mouth toward one end and its anus toward the other end, creating a front and back directionality to it that a regular urchin doesn't have. And we do have a correct guess from M. Lim saying it's a heart urchin. Heart urchin, yes. Awesome. So which end is the mouth and which end is the anus? I can't even tell. The, can you see which end has a, has a deeper cleft in it? I think this one is the deeper groove. All right, the deeper groove is where you're gonna find the mouth. The mouth, awesome. So one end is the mouth. So that must mean that the other end is the anus. We figured this animal out. <laughs> nice work. Good job, you guys. There's another fun one here. Um, well, I think it's fun. Maybe some of our viewers at home might not think it's fun because it's kind of gross. Uh, again, let me see if I can get some of the mud off it so that you can have a better look at what this animal is. This mud feels amazing, by the way. It's so smooth and silky. It's really fun. I wish that you all could be touching it right now. Does it make you want a mud facial, Kelly? It does. And I, I think I might go for it here. At yeah, the end. you have to go for it. <laughs> All right, let's get this it's animal rinsed off because I know that it doesn't look like much while it's covered in the mud. Here we go. That's a bit better. Ooh. What does that this feel animal, like? It feels like, hmm, it's like a little water balloon kind of but it's fairly firm um, and it's covered in stripes or rings almost that's what it looks like there's also a red a line of red down the side of this worm oh, and of course very the residual nice. mud are there any guesses coming in of what this animal might be someone's <laughs> asking kelly what it smells like oh let me give it a sniff oh it smells really strong, like garlic. Mm. Someone says I it's mean, so cute, which it totally is. I love that some of our audience members think this is cute because there's only a special kind of person that thinks that worms are cute. And um, I'm glad that we have some of those people watching here today especially such a stinky one that's a very nice garlic worm and you can always tell when someone's been out mud dredging and brought the garlic worms back to the lab because the whole building smells like rotting garlic <laughs> that's hilarious what are these red marks what are those red marks good question so can you can you rinse them off a little more and we can get a closer look sure. at them it, it looks seems like to have a little bit of um 
mucus on it that's holding the mud tight against the body of this worm. Mm -hmm. So those nice bright, anytime you see something bright red and soft sticking out of an animal, a really they look like good tentacles. Guess. Yeah, they do. These ones do look like little tentacles or little little sort of stubby spaghetti strands. A really good guess is going to be gills. So this is where they're pumping their bright red pigment laden blood out into their little into these little tentacles on their sides for gas exchange. As you can smell, Kelly, as you were telling us, it's a it's a pretty anoxic environment. And so the ability to stick your gills out through the side of your body uh, allows the animal as it moves around in the sediment a better chance of capturing what oxygen is there. So it would normally just be buried right in all of this mud, totally hidden. It sure would. And it's a it's a deposit feeder. It's one of the many, many animals in the mud there that are going to be just basically chewing their way through the mud, consuming it as they go, ingesting it as they go, and then digesting all the organic detritus and any microbes off the sediment grains. So they basically eat this stuff. They eat that stuff. And then they Whoa. poop it out. They poop it out <laughs> even cleaner. <laughs> well, it feels really smooth. So I wonder how many times this handful of mud has gotten pooped out by worms. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a lot. Probably somebody's a asking, lot. Somebody's asking if it's a sea cucumber. It uh, does we, look like one. We should keep our eyes peeled for sea cucumbers. Yeah. Yes. We should, we may find them, but this one's a worm and not a sea cucumber. Um, all right. Someone else was asking about sea hares, uh, which we should keep our eyes peeled. We might find a, a nudibranch, you never know. We probably won't in this show, just because um, the animals that we're finding are ones that came up from inside the mud at the bottom of the seafloor, but you never know what you might catch on a dredge. That's the fun part. Every single one is different. There's another kind of worm in my hand here. Ooh, a bonus worm. But it's red, pretty color. Yeah. It looks like it has some, it, it does have stripes as well or segments to it. Mm -hmm. And Possibly this end here might be the mouth, I think, but I'm not an <laughs> expert. <laughs> well, it might be a, a glycerid worm, in which case we, we might see a fabulous pharynx get everted with little teeth on the end of it. And that would be on this end? Uh, well, it would be on the front end. So if that's the front end, then yeah. <laughs> it's a, a little hard <laughs> to tell. It's a little hard to tell, yeah. And well, I see that. Um, Dave has just picked up another kind of worm that Ooh. maybe I'll hold on to this one for a second and also show you the one that Dave's got. Great. <laughs> so again, I know this doesn't look like a worm at first, and I would have thought it was just a big clump of the mud, except that there happens to be part of an animal sticking out one end. Oh, great. Somebody's living in it. Yeah. So that's a spectacular tube that worm has made. Can you, uh, how sturdy does it feel, Kelly? Not very, it feels just like the mud actually. And yeah, I can even pick off little bits of the tube. So it, it appears to be made just of the same material that's floating around in here in our sorting table. Mm, and it's all glued together with mucus. What a lovely yeah. place to live. <laughs> a mucus tube of mud. <laughs> awesome. So this, we've seen tube worms in some of our other live shows, but they made their tubes out of different material. Um, so here's a new new kind of species that, that creates its tube out of the mud rather than some of the other ones made their homes in calcium or other substances, but here's a mud tube worm. That's great. So that's two different worms we've got so far. Yeah. So yeah, and there's a likely candidate for who might well be making those tubes. It's a very elegant worm. I think there's another one right here by my fingers. It's very hard to tell though, because everything is so muddy. But yeah, Stacy's got some water for me here. Whoop. <laughs> A third kind of worm. I hope that you at home, you viewers really are enjoying the worms as much as I am, because I know some people think worms are gross, but they're pretty exciting. 
Those are fabulous. Over the years, I was just counting them up. We found about 26 different families of polychaetes in the dredges. Whoa. And how many years have you been doing these dredges? Oh, goodness. I've almost lost track. Since 2006. Amazing. That's a lot of mud. Can you see the way this worm is moving in my hand? Can you see its little feet, its little parapodia? Yeah, so along the edges of on both sides of this worm, it, it seems to have little bumps or bristles maybe. Mm. And it's using those to help. Th those bristles are getting some traction on your hand to help it claw its way along. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Cool. Well, I want to show you guys a little bit about our setup here and how we're able to collect uh, uh, more animals than just what's sitting in the sorting table in front of me. So while I've been talking to you so far, Stacy's been hosing all the mud from the sorting table down the chute at one end. And we actually have a system set up where we're catching the animals in a set of sieves underneath the sorting table. So let's examine what's in the biggest sieve. There's actually three more underneath. Oh, we got another one of those, uh, or maybe that's the same garlic worm that was now washed down after I let go of it. All right, and um, we have a number of other um, interesting tubes made of mud and another species that we haven't looked at yet. These things. These are sharp. They feel Ooh. like they feel like shell or bone almost. But they don't look like animals or anything. Here's another one here. Ah, uh, Chaz, you're too smart for us. You know what these are. Just seeing if there's any more of them. I don't see any more. Let me see if I can just rinse my hand a little bit more with you. So you can get a good look at these without my muddy fingers everywhere. Aha, uh -huh. Chaz has already noticed Stacy's earrings. Can we look at Stacy's earrings for a second? So Stacy's earrings are made of the exact same creature that I'm holding in my hand. And um, these are especially interesting because these were used as currency by First Nations people in our area, not just in our area, actually. Um, it turns out that First Nations people had well-established trading routes that took them all over North America. One nation would interact with another, and they used these shells as the money that they would change hands as they traded goods and services with one another. Um, so they, they actually use these shells across much of North America, even as far east as almost the Great Lakes and down into the States and up into Alaska. So many different nations used these shells as currency. And it was considered a status symbol. If you had jewelry like Stacy has with her earrings, if you were wearing these shells, they were, um, it was a sign that you were very wealthy. So there you go. And That's believe unlucky. it or not, First Nations people had the ability to harvest these shells. We were in 80 meters of water today, but um, they had ways of harvesting shells from deep water that didn't involve hydraulic dredges like what we used. So that's pretty impressive. And these scaphopods in particular, this is, uh, this is the genus Rhabdus, and they're, um, they're quite thin shelled and quite delicate. And most of the currency was, uh, was the genus Dentalium, which looks similar, but you'll, uh, it's got a sturdier and a more robust shell that probably survived those, uh, those inland trading journeys a little bit better. And they may have lived in, in shallower water, but, uh, but it was still a non-trivial task to harvest them. Ooh, what so else Stacey's got built us trade? a little dish. Um, Ooh, other, there's more scaphopods in here. And so I'll add mine to the collection here. Oh my, we've got a whole, whole bunch of goodies that Stacy has filtered out of the sieves underneath the sorting table here. Here are some animals. What do these animals look like to you guys at home? Ooh. And who should be afraid of those? 
great. I want to rinse one of these off a little bit more. Yeah, so they, these animals, they've retracted inside of their shells now. They're hidden from us. <laughs> somebody says snails, and somebody says that other snails should be afraid of them. That's true, but also the other mollusk that we've seen, the one that Chaz identified, the scaphopods, are terrified of these moon snails because the moon snails, these are uh, these are the same genus as the big fat moon snails you sometimes find in the intertidal, but a different species. And they cruise through the mud in search of hapless little scaphopods. And the scaphopods can retract into their shells to protect themselves, but it doesn't help when they're confronted by this drilling predator who just savagely drills a hole right through the middle of their shell and sucks them out and consumes them. There is a bivalve that has met that very fate. Yeah, so this hole in the shell of this clam that I'm holding was drilled by a much larger moon snail than the ones we're seeing here. But the same idea, the, the animals can drill right into the hole, into the shells of other animals. So what that's... a terrible way to go. Imagine someone drilling a hole through the, the wall of your house and slurping you out. <laughs> that sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what else we have here in our catch today. Excellent, some more worms, some more tubes. This is great fun. There's lots to see in here. Look at all the collection of our heart urchins. So we found quite a lot of them, including, oh, let me show you this. Look, it's a baby heart urchin. It's so small and cute. Cutest heart urchin award. So big and little, there we go. Very Somebody's fun. asking if there are any other clams. <laughs> other clams, actually, I think there are in the first, um, the bucket that, or the jar over here that we were looking at, there are some other clams. Um, I'll pick them up, although they've got their shells closed at the moment, so you can't see their, their little foot. But these are some clams for you. Oh, those are great. Those are Yoldia. Does anybody, does anybody know what's special about this kind of clam? I don't know what's special about this kind of clam. Other than I presume that they can burrow into the mud really well. They sure can, they're great burrowers and, uh, and you might be able to see them sticking out their feet and, and pretty actively trying to, trying to make a break for it out of your hand even. And these are uh, part of an ancient lineage of clams whose gills are still used just for respiration. They're not used for feeding. And so they have really elongated lips that they stick out into the sediments to grab their food and bring it back to their mouths. And then in the meantime, the gills are much shorter and more compact than clam gills that you might have seen in a section. And they're loaded up with bright red respiratory pigments. And uh, they're exclusively used for respiration. So no, no filter feeding coming from the gills of these clams. Cool. That's awesome. Some of them even appear almost transparent. Are they the same kind, the smaller two and the bigger two? I think you've got a couple of different species in there. Yeah. Excellent. Um, there's another creature that has just appeared. Yeah, it's over here in one of the... Sure. Let's have a look here. Can you see the red thing in here? It's in some water now. Any guesses as to what this red colored creature is? Down here, it's got some eyeballs by the looks of it. I'll pick it up here in just a second, but I don't want to stress it out too, too much. Oh, it's still moving. Yeah. Awesome. There you go. Ooh, very nice. <laughs> yeah, so this is um, this is not a creature that lives in the mud, though, is it? How did it end up there? It probably got snagged in the dredge on the way up, I'm guessing. 
rather than being found buried in the mud. You happen to be in the wrong place. Nice catch. Someone says maybe a prawn. Yeah, I think prawn or shrimp. I'm not sure which one actually. Do you know? Uh, I bet Dave knows. Oh, maybe Dave knows. Yeah, ask Dave. Dave says it's a shrimp. Okay. But it's a nice big one. Mm, I'm gonna, gonna put gonna it back a... in some water for a second. You could have quite a dinner, Kelly. You could have a, a mud flavored shrimp and then some mud flavored urchin gonads and maybe a little mud flavored clam. What would happen if I ate this? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not tried, going to. I tried, uh, I tried the gonads once on a, on a borrowing heart urchin because the urchin had broken open during a dredge. And, uh, and I thought I'd sample them, which seemed like a really good idea until I tasted them. And they tasted just like that mud. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not going to try it. <laughs> Very wise. I'll take your word for it that um, it's been sampled already. We don't need to try it again. Well, it's only Very an N of cool. one, but. I, I trust your expertise on this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, do we have any other animals to see before we go? Here's another heart urchin. Um, are there any other questions before we before we go, because our show is already winding to an end. Can you check the tiny screen, Kelly? Do we have the tiny screen? The tiny sieve? This is the second tiniest sieve that we're looking at right now. There's a brittle star in here. Ooh. It's hard for me to pick that one up, so I'm going to let Luke try to view it with the camera instead. Oh, I see it. They're called brittle stars because their arms are quite brittle and they will sort of fall off if you don't pick them up just right. Oh, very nice so catch. It's related to regular sea stars. They have five arms, but they're very breakable. They do, and they have enormous armpits that they <laughs> incubate their, their young in. So their embryos mature in their armpits before being released. In their armpits. That's a little bit of a different way of raising your young. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last creature. What's that? Mm, what does it feel like? It feels like uh, maybe like a little macaroni or <laughs> a, a pea. <laughs> okay. It's, Is it so it's quite hard squishy. or soft? Yeah, it's a cooked macaroni. It has a very similar texture. I'm not going to eat it. Then can you see anything at all on the surface or is it just a little ball? It has kind of some stripes and then there seems to maybe be something at one end, some tentacles or something that are covered in mud. I'm not quite sure. Mm. Those little tentacles are going to be the gills that are at the uh, that are at the posterior end of the animal, and then the okay. anterior end, the face, is uh, it's a pretty unprepossessing face. <laughs> it's hard another, to imagine that that's a face. Another another animal that's just eating the mud, and we got a couple of great guesses. Somebody saying maybe an anemone. Someone saying maybe a cucumber. It's actually the that's the most common group of organisms we've already found. The most common phylum we've already found but it's a new family. See it looks can... like it has some segments or rings. Oh, there's the clue. Yes, Aha. a worm, an annelid worm, a new family of wormies, yes. Yes, excellent. Great, the sternospids are the owl worms. Owl worms, Yeah, that's a good name for them. Cool, all right. Well, we have a whole bunch of animals that we need to start putting back in the water. Before we do that, are there any final questions from any of our viewers? As you may remember from some of our other dredges, we are we make a point of um, we dredge the animals from the bottom, but then we return them all over the side when we're done and put them back in their home. So we're going to do that here momentarily rather than keep them up in this foreign surface environment. Any questions?
All right, well, we maybe should turn things over to Phil so that he can do a little draw to see who wins a toque this week. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, so uh, as we mentioned, anyone who commented or uh, sent in a question, I put your name in the draw for a toque. So here's our BMSC red toque right here. And here's our bowl full of names. The winner of the toque is M Lim. M! M wins the toque. Get in touch with us and we will connect you with your toque. Awesome. Oh, M is saying redraw. Oh, M says redraw. If any of you redraw. have watched our previous shows, you already know who M is, um, our former presenter. <laughs> so we'll That's redraw. Right. I'm pretty so sure I put Em everyone's already name in here, just so you know, that's how it works. <laughs> All right. Chaz Francis, you got a two today. Chaz! Yay! Awesome. Congratulations. All right. I'd love to say thank you to all of you for watching today's live show and supporting what we do here at BMSC. You can always check out our website, BamfieldMSC.com, if you want to learn more about what's going on here. I'd also love to say thank you so much to Dr. Marjorie Wanham for her expertise in interpreting all these bizarre animals and um, for, for helping to explain why what, what the things that I'm holding in my hand are. And you know what? Most of our mud has washed away and I forgot to give myself a mud facial before we go, but <laughs> that's okay. We'll do that next time. Thank you so much for watching and goodbye from the Alta from all of us crew members here aboard the Alta. See you next time. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Everyone.